Okay, so today we are really diving deep into the Ferguson TE20. Yeah. Using this incredible service manual, mm. specifically looking at the TEA20 and TED20 models. Yeah. And, you know, from the looks of this stack of excerpts, right. this isn't just a quick tune-up we're talking about. Yeah. This is really getting to the heart of what makes this machine tick. I think one of the most interesting things you've pulled out here is the way this manual is written. Oh, absolutely. It's very conversational. Yeah. You know, it doesn't feel like a dry technical document. Oh, not at all. It feels like someone who actually knows these tractors inside and out. Yeah. Is trying to share their knowledge. It really does. And I think that speaks to a different era of machinery. Yeah. You know, for sure. This was built to last and they expected owners to be hands on. And it's interesting, you know, they talk a lot about the Ferguson system. Yes. And they even sort of capitalize it in the writing as if it's something right. to be revered it was a point of pride yeah and for good reason right Absolutely. this wasn't just a marketing gimmick no yeah. this three-point linkage that harry ferguson developed completely changed everything revolutionized agriculture yeah i mean can you imagine it's hard to even picture now trying to wrangle some of those heavy implements right onto a tractor without that system exactly it's incredible and it's woven throughout this manual yeah it's really emphasized and for good reason absolutely it made attaching and detaching implements so much easier and safer and safer of course yeah but it's not just about convenience either no really. not at all it's about that precision control exactly being able to control the depth the the angle the size of the implement yeah it's huge huge difference and speaking of huge let's talk about this engine okay. i mean some of the details in here are just mind-blowing like what did you realize that the cooling system alone holds 20 pints of oil. 20 pints. 20 pints. Wow. That's a serious cooling system. That is a lot of oil. And you know it makes sense when you think about it. Oh, yeah. These tractors were workhorses. Day in and day out. They had to be able to handle anything. Yeah, absolutely. And keeping that engine cool was crucial. Crucial, yeah. Now, there's this other section here that I found fascinating. Okay. And... It's all these charts for engine clearances, right. crankshaft, pistons, valves. Important stuff. And they're measured in thousandths of an inch. That's precision. It's amazing the level of detail. It is. So for those of us who maybe aren't as familiar with the intricacies of engine mechanics, sure. what's the significance of those tiny measurements? Well, it all comes down to reducing friction. Okay. When you have those clearances set just right, mm -hmm. Everything moves smoothly, right? less wear and tear. It's like a perfectly choreographed dance of sure. metal parts all working in harmony. I like that. And that precision engineering is a big part of why these tractors were so reliable. For sure. They were built to last. Absolutely. Speaking of which, I noticed we have this diagram labeled as an exploded view. Oh, yeah. Of the cooling system. Right. What is an exploded view? So it's basically like taking the whole thing apart. Yeah. and laying out all the pieces so you can see how they fit together. Oh, interesting. Like a puzzle. Okay, so it gives you a really clear picture of yeah. all the individual components and how yeah. they come together. Exactly. Now, I did notice a difference between the TEA20 and the TED20 in this view. Oh, really? Yeah, the thermostat is in a different location. Interesting. On the TEA20, it's right on the cylinder head. Okay. But on the TED20, it's in the top hose. Oh, huh, interesting. It's a small detail. Yeah. But it just goes to show that even within the same model line, right. there were variations. Makes sense. Subtle differences in the engineering. Absolutely. And speaking of variations, let's talk about troubleshooting. Okay. Because this manual does not mess around when it comes to diagnosing problems. No, it doesn't. It's very thorough. It is. So let's say you're dealing with overheating. Common problem. A classic engine issue. Right. The manual walks you through a very systematic checklist. Yeah, step by step. Of potential culprits. Yeah, like a detective. Exactly. What could it be? It starts with the basics. Right, the obvious stuff. Is the radiator blocked? Yeah. Is the fan belt tight? Exactly. Simple things first. But then it goes deeper. Okay. You know, it starts looking at things like valve clearances or a worn cylinder liner. Wow. It's really impressive. It is. And it shows how much thought went into creating this manual. Absolutely. They wanted to cover every possibility. And they didn't just stop at diagnostics. No. There are entire sections dedicated to maintaining vital components. Like what? The oil filter, the air cleaning. Okay, those are important ones. And you guessed it, more exploded views. 
got to love an exploited view. So it's not just about fixing problems. Right. It's about preventing them in the first place. Preventative maintenance is key. Absolutely. And, you know, looking at all this, yeah. it really makes you appreciate the level of engineering that went into these tractors. Well, for sure. It wasn't just about building a machine. No. It was about building something that would last. And be repairable. Exactly. They really sweated the small stuff. They did. And it shows. It really does. It really is amazing how much thought went into making these tractors so owner serviceable. It is. And speaking of that, I want to dig a little deeper into the engine specs. Sure. Because you've highlighted some fascinating sections here. Mm -hmm. Like this one on tolerances for the TEA20 engine. I mean, I'm looking at these measurements. Yeah. Thousandths of an inch. Precision. It's incredible how precise they were. Yeah, that's what it all comes down to in an engine. For those of us who maybe don't have an engineering degree. Sure. What are we really talking about when we say tolerances? So basically it's the acceptable range of variation. Okay. In the dimensions of the engine parts. So how much wiggle room you have. Exactly. Got it. And there's not much wiggle room here. No, not at all. We're talking thousandths of an inch. Why is that so important? It all comes down to friction. Okay. You want those parts to fit together. Right. But you need that tiny bit of clearance. So they don't grind against each other. Exactly. As they move. Yeah. If those tolerances are off, you get friction. And that's bad. Bad for the engine. Make well, it more wear and tear reduced efficiency. It's amazing to think they could achieve that level of precision back then. It's pretty impressive. No fancy computers or anything? Nope. Just good old fashioned engineering know-how. And that's why these tractors just kept running. That's part of it, for sure. Now, you know, we're talking about precision. Yeah. I'm looking at this diagram of the piston and connecting rod assembly. Okay. It's a work of art. It is a well-designed piece of machinery. It is. And there's this note here about using a specific service tool. Oh, yeah. To mount the gudgeon pin. Right, the gudgeon pin. And they even say to heat the piston in boiling water. It sounds very precise. Before fitting the pin. Yeah, there's a reason for all of that. I'm assuming so. That gudgeon pin is what connects the piston to the connecting rod. Okay, and for those who might not be familiar with those terms, sure. what exactly is the gudgeon pin's job? Sure. So you've got the piston moving up and down in the cylinder. Right. Gudgeon pin is like the pivot point. Okay. It allows the connecting rod to transfer the force from the piston to the crankshaft. Ah, so it's what turns that up and down motion into rotation. Exactly. Which ultimately powers the tractor. Exactly. Wow, that little pin is doing a lot of work. It is a small part with a big job. No wonder they're so specific about how it's installed. You want to be sure it's right? Absolutely. And oh. heating the piston before fitting the pin. Yeah, that's to make the hole slightly bigger. So it slides in easier? Exactly. Thermal expansion. Clever. Prevents damage. Makes sense. And using that special tool yeah. ensures the pin goes in perfectly straight. No wobbling around. Precisely. Got it. It's all about those details. It really is. I'm also noticing a section on piston ring gap. Ah, uh, yes. Another important detail. They're very specific about where to measure this gap. Right at the bottom of the ring travel. Okay, and why is that? Because that's where the ring is going to be at its widest point. Due to the pressure from the combustion. Exactly. So if the gap is too small at that point... You're going to have problems. Problems like... The ring could bind against the cylinder wall. Not good. Not good at all. What kind of problems would that cause? Loss of compression. Yeah. Increased wear on the rings in the cylinder. And that could lead to... A whole world of expensive repairs. So checking that gap is crucial. Absolutely. It's a simple check. Right. But it can save you a lot of trouble. Prevention is key. As always. Okay. Let's move on to another component. Okay. The oil filter. Ah, yes, the oil filter, keeping that engine lubricated. I'm looking at this exploded view. Yeah, it's a bit more involved than you might think. It looks pretty complex for an oil filter. It's actually a pretty sophisticated system for its time. Really? Yeah, most tractors back then had simpler oil filters. Interesting. This one uses a replaceable element. Okay, so you don't have to clean it, just swap it out. Exactly. That's handy. Much easier for the owner. So what are we looking at here in this exploded view? So... You've got the filter element itself, of course. Right. But you've also got a pressure relief valve. And what does that do? That prevents the oil pressure from getting too high. Oh, okay. That's important. Very important. And there's a bypass valve, too? Right. That's a safety feature. Okay. If the filter element gets completely clogged, right. that bypass valve lets some oil flow through unfiltered. So the engine doesn't get starved of oil. Exactly. 
It's better to have some lubrication than none at all. That's really smart engineering. It is. They thought of everything. Speaking of oil, quick question. Shoot. How much oil does the TE20 sump hold? Let me see. 12 pints. 12 pints. Plus another four in the auxiliary tank. Okay, so 16 pints total. That's right. That's more than I expected. It's a good amount. Okay, on to the air cleaner. Another critical component. And we have yet another exploded view. Of course. This looks pretty involved, too. It's not just a simple air filter. No. No, this is an oil bath air cleaner. Okay, I've heard of those, but never really understood how they worked. So it's a two-stage filtration system. Okay. The first stage is the oil bath itself. Yeah, okay. The air comes in, and the larger particles right. get trapped in the oil. Makes sense. Then the air goes up through the filter element. Which catches the finer dust. Exactly. Like an obstacle course for dust. Pretty much. I'm seeing here that the manual mentions some of the oil is actually drawn upward yeah. into the cleaner element when the engine is running. That's right. How does that work? The engine suction. Okay. It pulls some of that oil up. Interesting. Which helps to trap even more dirt. Wow. They really were thorough. They were. And they really stress the importance of regular cleaning. Oh, yeah. A clogged air filter will kill your engine's performance. It restricts the airflow. Exactly. The engine can't breathe. So how often did they recommend cleaning it? Every 10 hours. Every 10 hours. Or even twice a day in really dusty conditions. That's serious maintenance. It's essential for keeping the engine running smoothly. This manual really drives home the point. It does. That regular maintenance is key. Absolutely. You know, it's incredible how much thought went into every single aspect yeah. of this tractor. They didn't cut corners. No, they didn't. They were building a tool that would last. A true workhorse. Exactly. And this manual gives you the knowledge. That's all right there. To keep it running for years to come. That's what it's all about. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground here. We have. But we're not done yet. There's more. Oh, yeah. We haven't even touched on the carburetor yet. Oh, right. The carb. And the manual actually mentions two different types. It does. The Shubler marvel and the zenith 24t2 ah the zenith so tell me about these carburetors well the schiebler marvel was the standard carburetor okay for the early te20 models makes sense it was a good solid carburetor known for its simplicity and the zenith the zenith 24t2 came later was it an improvement it was a more advanced design. In what way? It had adjustable main jet settings. Oh, so you could fine tune the fuel air mixture. Exactly. Why was that important? Well, it allowed for better performance in different conditions. Like? Like high altitudes, for example. Ah, because the air is thinner at higher altitudes. That's right. So you need a different fuel air mixture. Precisely. And the Zenith allowed for that. It did. I'm noticing a chart here dedicated to carburetor adjustments for high altitudes. Yep. They really thought of everything. They did. They wanted to make sure this tractor could handle anything. It's all about adaptability. Exactly. Now I'm looking at this exploded view of the Zenith 24T2 carburetor. Okay. And I'd say it looks a little intimidating. Carburetors can be a bit daunting. Yeah, there are a lot of parts in there. There are, but it's all logically laid out. Right. And this exploded view helps to break it down. It does. So you can see how it all goes together. Okay, so it's like a roadmap. Exactly. To understanding how the carburetor works. And the manual doesn't just show you the parts. No. It actually walks you through how to adjust everything. Seriously? Yeah. Idle speed, slow running mixture, main jet. Wow, so you could really fine tune the carburetor. Absolutely. That's amazing. It's all about achieving that perfect fuel air mix. And getting that perfect mix is a bit of an art form. It takes a little practice. The manual does emphasize the importance of cleanliness. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Keeping the carburetor clean is crucial. A clean carburetor is a happy carburetor. I like that. Any dirt or debris in there can mess things up. And then you're talking about performance issues. Exactly. So regular cleaning is a must. Absolutely. Well, this has been fascinating. It has. We've really gone deep on the TE20 engine. We have. From the tiniest tolerances to the complex workings of the carburetor. It's a well-engineered machine. It really is. And there's still more to explore. Oh, that's right. We haven't even talked about the governor system yet. Oh, the governor. That's coming up next. Oh, I can't wait. Stay tuned. All right. Let's talk about this governor. Okay. Because it sounds like it plays a pretty crucial role. It's essential. In keeping the engine running smoothly. It's the unsung hero of consistent engine speed. So how does it work? Well, the TE20 uses what's called a centrifugal governor. Okay. Which basically means it uses spinning weights. Spinning weights. To control the engine speed. 
Okay, now that sounds a little counterintuitive. It does seem a bit strange at first. How do spinning weights help to regulate speed? It's all about centrifugal force. Okay. So imagine the tractor's just puttering along, mm -hmm. not under a, a heavy load. Car. The governor weights are spinning. Right. But the centrifugal force isn't that strong. So what's happening with the throttle? The throttle's being held open. Okay. By the governor spring. Got it. Now let's say you hit a heavy patch of soil. Okay, the load increases. Exactly. It happens then? The engine speed starts to drop. Right. Because it's working harder. And what about the governor weights? They spin slower. Okay. Which means less centrifugal force. So the governor spring takes over. Exactly. What does it do? It pulls on the control rack. Okay. Which adjusts the throttle linkage. And that opens up the throttle. Exactly. More fuel and air into the engine. Which brings the speed back up. Precisely. So it's a self-adjusting system. Exactly. A beautiful piece of mechanical engineering. Constantly responding to changes in load. Keeping that engine speed right where it needs to be. It's amazing. And the best part is it's all mechanical. No electronics involved? Nope. Just good old-fashioned physics. I love it. Now, I, re I remember you mentioned engine surge. Right. And how the governor helps to prevent that. Exactly. Engine surge is those sudden fluctuations in speed. Yeah, like the engine's revving up and down erratically. Exactly, and it can be a real problem. So how does the governor prevent that? It's the governor lever spring. Okay. It acts like a damper. Okay, so it smooths out those fluctuations. Okay. And keeps the engine running smoothly. Precisely. So what's the key to keeping this governor system happy? Lubrication. 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 Of course. The manual really stresses that. It makes sense. Keep those moving parts greased. And it'll keep running smoothly. Exactly. Now I can't resist. What is it? We have to look at the troubleshooting section. Of course, there's always a troubleshooting section. And there's a whole table here. Oh, yeah. Dedicated to governor problems. Let's see it. It's pretty comprehensive. What kind of issues does it cover? Everything from excessive engine speed mm -hmm. to erratic idling. Makes sense. Those are classic governor problems. It even tells you how to prevent fuel from leaking. Oh, that's a good one. Into the governor housing. Yeah, you don't want fuel in there. Why not? It could really mess with the delicate mechanisms. So how do you prevent that? Regular inspections. Of course. Making sure everything's tight and clean. Preventative maintenance is key. Always. Well, this deep dive into the Ferguson TE20 has been incredible. It really has. I feel like we've only scratched the surface. There's always more to learn. But I have a newfound appreciation you. for the engineering that went into this machine. It's a testament to a different era of design. Absolutely. They really don't make them like they used to. They don't. And the service manual. Yeah. It's a treasure trove of information. It really is. It's the key to keeping these tractors running. For generations to come. Exactly. And on that note, okay. we'll wrap up this deep dive. Until next time. Keep those engines humming. And those wheels turning.